Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord?
No, no response. Good morning, St. Andrews. Okay, welcome to worship this morning, whether you are here in person, online, or listening from the car park on this lovely sunny Sunday. Now, I have to tell you, the past week uh, for me has been one of those weeks where, for various reasons, uh, nothing particularly went according to plan. It was a little bit like driving through a car park which has got too many jada bars or uh, speed bumps, as they're called here. So you drive over one and the suspension hasn't quite leveled out before you crunch into the next one. So that is how my week went, which was less than ideal, but however, the sun came up and shone on me this morning. I don't think, however, that it does us any harm now and again to have a reminder that life is not always plain sailing. Sometimes it's bumpy, sometimes it's rough. However, that then I think can give us an opportunity to uh, focus in on the fact that if we have faith and trust in God, God will see us through to wherever we need to get to or to have us uh, become whoever we're supposed to be in God's good plan. So with that in mind, uh, let's all join in the moments for worship this morning. Let's breathe in those moments as we prepare to worship God. And this morning, the call to worship is being presented by Bob Monick. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Monick, and I also am one of your elders here at St. Andrews. And uh, summertime is always a little bit different from uh, winter time, so to speak. And uh, it's no different. We are very busy and uh, at home. And the reason is just dropping in. It's my uh, part of the family from uh, Cardiff in Wales. And we have been very busy, and so had they. I'm really surprised to see them up because they came home from the ferry from the mainland this morning after 2 o'clock. So. Good to see you all there. <laughs> Anyways, um, they're leaving this week too, so we take every second that we can do to share together. In our call to worship, there is a regular font and there is the, um, the heavy font. And if you could respond with the heavy one, that would be just great. Are you awake? Are you alert? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Are you watching the signs? Are you interpreting what is happening today? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Do you see opportunities for ministry? Do you see the poor, the homeless, the hungry, and the needy? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Come, let us worship and let us work in the reign of God. Christ has extended the invitation. Let us work together in the reign of God on earth. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us to wait on you, but we get tired of it. Your answers to prayer you call for, for us to serve you. The promise of your coming kingdom, they all seem to take so long. You tell us to, wait, to watch for your coming, Lord, but we're not sure how to prepare for a thief in the night, an undisclosed time, and your discerning habit of secrecy and ministry. Yet something inside us whispers that they can be found if we look, that you're always, always coming to us, and that both the waiting and the watching are more about being open to you now than about trying not to be surprised in the future. And so we wait, so we come to wait, and to learn how to stay alert so that we can catch the glimpses of your glory and fill us and fill our every day. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
Today we're hearing from the disciple Matthew again, as he wrote down another one of Jesus' parables, the story of the ten bridesmaids. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. The foolish took their lamps, but they took no extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Master, to arrives, fall in line for the wedding party. Let us begin. Oh God, we come before thee. Do I know you? Hold up your lamps so I can see your faces. Well, we have no oil. Our light has gone out. If you are my friends, why didn't you come when I called? Come, Judah. It's time to begin. I, I, I'm sorry. I... No, you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. As you see, this parable's focus is a reminder to be ready, be prepared. Be ready for what? Your family is probably prepared too. You might have an emergency kit at home or in the car. Things like preparing for when friends come over for supper or a sleepover. This parable is a symbolic story. It has another meaning. The bridesmaids represent people of the earth. The bridegroom represents Jesus. The people of the earth do not know when Jesus will return, but when he does return, some are ready. As they read their Bibles, talk and listen to God, live in ways that show God's love to others, some are not ready. Even though they wanted to be, they intended to be, but they just did not keep prepared. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King. 
<laughs> you see, we did, it happened again where we went and did it again. Oh, man, it's nothing like hearing the voices of God's people. One of the things I love about Sundays when I get to sit and just enjoy is I get to turn my head and hear the voices of God's people singing. It is so great. Wonderful for God's people to be together, and good morning to you. I'm Jeremy. For those of you that don't know me, I get to be the pastor here. And I am working with a great team, including Portia, who puts together these videos every week. Portia is going to head out right now and spend some time with kids. She's also got some crafts and games and activities planned for those kids. So uh, kids, if you'd like to go spend some time and unpack this story with her, she would just love to spend that time with you. When I was a kid, I, uh, I could be a little bit mischievous, and I particularly loved the game Hide and Seek. Uh, and in fact, in the church that my dad had pioneered, which was meeting in a high school at the time, there was this one occasion when I kind of snuck out of the worship session because it was ahead of when the kids were going to be sent out. And all the kids would get sent out, and they'd go down the hall into one of the classrooms, and they'd have kids' time, just like we've sent kids out to have some kids' time with Portia. On this particular occasion, I snuck out, and I thought it would be really neat to sneak and into the cabinets uh, that were underneath the sink, and I left it open just a crack so that I could see what was going on. And sure enough, I heard them all come down the aisle, and I, uh, they came into the room, and the lesson started, and I thought it was fun just to kind of observe playing a game of hide-and-seek. Well, one of the uh, teenage helpers came over, and she was doing something in the sink, and she looked down, and she saw these two eyes looking up at her, and she ah! jumped back, opened up the cupboard, and there I was. <clears throat> Did I mention I could be a little mischievous when I was young? Well, I proceeded to get up and join the class. Needless to say, those pastor's kids, you got to watch out for them, right, Emma? I liked playing hide-and-seek, but the problem in that situation was I hadn't actually told them there was a game going on. I hadn't told them I was playing. I hadn't said, ready or not, here I come. I hadn't called any of the usual ways that we use in order to say that there is a game going on in hide-and-seek. So what we can hear in today's parable is Jesus essentially saying, pay attention, wake up, there's a game afoot, and that game is called Christian Living. It's hide and seek, as it were, and he invites us to come and to seek him, to play the game with him. It's as if he's saying, ready or not, here I come. Will we notice? The passage is taken, as Portia's mentioned, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. We'll read verses 1 through 13. I'll read the portions in regular font. I invite you to read the portions in bold. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Matthew 25 comes on the heels of Matthew 24. I'd invite you to go back and do some reading on what comes just before this and what comes just after. Because in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking all about that final day when he will return in glory. He will come, he says, like a thief in the night. No one knows the day or the hour. Now, when I was growing up and we sang songs like we just sung, sing Hosanna, 
we also thought about this passage in terms of what's called the parousia, the second coming, the return of Christ in glory that was talked about by the angels in Acts chapter 1, that he will return just as he has ascended. But there's more going on in this as well, as there was for those first Christians. See, you know, when I was growing up, there were books like Left Behind uh, that got written. I'm seeing some nods from those that might have read that. Or uh, even better was The Thief in the Night. Did you watch that one? Yes. Oh, and Sue has the scowl on her face. It's like, it's a super scary Christian movie. Craziness. But it's this idea that Jesus comes and everybody gets raptured except for those who were unbelieving. This is part of what shapes that thinking. But there was more going on in this story beyond just the perusia, the second coming. In Matthew 25, <clears throat> Jesus starts by saying, in that day, he wants us to think about ourselves as living within the end times in expectation of his imminent return. He says, in that day, there are ten virgins. You know, by virgins, he really means bridesmaids. I was grateful for how uh, Portia's story interpreted that well. Five were ready for the bridegroom, and they took extra oil, and five weren't ready. They didn't take the extra oil. And so, unex not unexpectedly, their lamps go out, and they have to go to the oil cellar, and they end up arriving late to the party, and they're told by the groom, I never knew you. Now, this might seem strange to our 21st century ears because we're not familiar with Middle Eastern wedding customs, right? Our wedding customs are a little bit different than that. I had the, had the joy this summer of participating in two, and I've got another one coming up. Yay! Uh, weddings taking place. Sorry, I just pointed for those of you at home at Tiffany and Justin getting married very soon. Um, the customs in, in the West especially are a little bit different than in the Middle East. The customs here, we're not waiting for the groom to arrive, but for the bride to arrive. This is the wedding party at Callum and Crystal's wedding standing around, and just before the ceremony starts, we would all then go and take our places in the seating area, and Callum and I aren't about to go up, and the procession isn't going to start until the bride is ready. And so we had to double check, is she ready? And she just kind of whispered from the uh, second floor at the top of the stairs, yes, I'm ready. All right, let's go. It's time to begin. That's our custom. But in the Middle East, especially in the first century, the wedding party began when the bridegroom arrived. Now, I don't know what he was doing until late in the night. Maybe he was out with his buddies having the equivalent of a bachelor party for first century Jews. I don't know. But what we do know is he doesn't show up. He is a long time coming. He doesn't show up until the middle of the night. <clears throat> I'd be getting ready to go to bed, quite frankly. But that's when the party is about to begin. The ceremony is about to take place. And now the bridal party has to rouse themselves and get ready to accompany him in because this is going to be the beginning of the big shindig, the big celebration. It will launch multiple days, in fact, of celebrating that will take place. We wonder, what's the oil about? There are many theories about what that is. I like how N.T. Wright puts it, however. He says, the oil is not really the point of the story. The point is, does the bridal party have enough? Are they prepared for the bridegroom's coming? Jesus, of course, is that bridegroom. Remember Matthew 24. Remember that question, he will come like a thief in the night. And in these days now, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, and before the great marriage supper of the Lamb, in these days called the church period of history, is the church ready for his coming? Are we living in expectation and readiness? Are we, the bridal party, ready to greet the groom who may come in the wee hours of the morning like a thief in the night? Our takeaway from this story is that there's really two things we need to be doing. And as we conclude this series on the kingdom of God, when we've been thinking about the kingdom of God like seeds and like yeast, uh, like fish being sorted, there are two things at the conclusion that we need to take home with us. Two things in order to be ready. The first is, are we expectant? And the second is, are we prepared? 
are we expectant? The bridal party shows up at Callum and Crystal's wedding or at Tiffany and Justin's wedding expecting that there's going to be a wedding, right? This seems, <laughs> it seems a little obvious, but it's true. You're not going to show up on Saturday, September the 10th for just any reason. We show up because we expect there's going to be a wedding on that day. Expectation is the beginning of readiness, do we expect to receive Christ, not just in the hereafter, but in the here and now? You see, for these early Christians, their expectation was not only that he would come again in glory, but that he would come to them moment by moment and show up to them. That is why Christianity grew from 12 or 120 on the day of Pentecost to 3,000 to over a million by the end of the first century. Remember, none of that with print media or television or radio. This is word of mouth people having experiences with Jesus Christ and then wanting others to know that same one. But it started with expectation. Did they expect that they would encounter Jesus in their day-to-day -day lives? And the same question is for us then. Because, let's be honest, sometimes we can forget that Christ, the designer of creation, actually comes to us moment by moment, can't we? We can kind of get on with all the work that needs to be done, even the good work around here, and we forget that Christ is coming to us in the most unexpected sometimes ways. Like this week, I got to hang out with uh, Brian. Brian is a young man who's living on the street. He got a spider bite and uh, popped over, he and his friend, to the pharmacy because it had somehow gotten infected. His hand was now about twice the size of his other hand. And the pharmacist said, you need to get that cleaned out. And so when I was coming out from spending some time up in, uh, with the ladies who were quilting, I don't quilt, you don't want to see my quilts, trust me. But when I was spending some time with them, I came out and uh, Joe and Brian came up to me and said, can you take him to the hospital? Because he needs to get that cleaned out. Could that interruption to my day have been a visit of Christ? Just as much as my conversations, lovely conversations, with some of the ladies who were doing quilting. Could that have also been a visit of Jesus Christ? See, we forget that the pattern of all creation is in fact, therefore, with us every moment of every day. What did he say at the end of Matthew? For lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. If he is, then we ought to expect that he will show up moment by moment, minute by minute as much as he will show up at the end of all days. One of my favorite authors, Eugene Peterson, wrote this great book called Christ Plays in 10,000 Places. The title taken uh, from this line in a poem called As Kingfishers Catch Fire. It ends this way. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. To the Father, through the features of men's faces. Christ showing up to us through quilting ladies and men living on the street. As much as Christ showing up to us in the company of friends and family gathered in worship. Christ showing up to us in our children and our parents. Christ showing up to us in those whom we like and quite frankly those who we would rather do without. Christ showing up to us moment by moment. Austin was sharing with me this week how he had this experience. He had uh, woke up Wednesday morning and his usual devotional time was praying that he might understand or he might experience, he might meet Christ again, that God would just be real to him on that day. And so uh, he pulled over as he was about to drive out of the shop parking lot and his boss, another believer, came by and threw a book at him. It wasn't the book, but he threw a book at him. And when uh, Austin looked at the title of the book, what was it? But uh, Case for, for Christ by Lee Strobel. Here, Christ showing up to him, not only in his, the generosity of his boss, but in this book as well. And then he's alone working on a site, and he went out to his truck from the back to the front. He went out to his truck for a shovel, and who should meet him but Fred? One of the elders from our congregation, 
I don't know if Fred was trying to get away from his home or just going for a walk or what was going on, but the Spirit led Fred to walk past the site just at the time that Austin came out. And so they had a lovely conversation. And then Austin was with us for the elders and staff barbecue that happened on Wednesday night as he's going to be the worship leader at the downtown congregation. And there, he's having these Christ-filled conversations as well. And he said by the end of the day, he says, I'm just meeting Christ over and over and over again. Did God answer the prayer that Austin had prayed? Yeah, of course he did. But part of it was in praying that prayer, Austin was expecting to meet Christ. And so saw Christ when he showed up. Matthew chapter 25 at the end of it, tells us another parable of where Christ will be. It's the parable of the Son of Man sitting in judgment, and he sorts sheep from goats, people one side and then the other. And the criterion that he uses to make that decision on who should be on one side and who should be on the other is this. When I was thirsty... You gave me a cup of water. When I was hungry, you gave me food to eat. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And both answer, ask him, Lord, when did we do this? And he will say to them, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. The parable isn't an encouragement for us to go and be nice to people. It is Jesus standing in solidarity, I identifying himself as those whom we would put on the fringes, those who are in need, those who ask for help. I got to see Christ this week in Brian when I took him to the hospital. I got to see Christ a little bit later with Joe. It's the best part of my job, eh, David? I get to sit down and chat with people. It's fantastic. And Joe was just telling me his life story telling me his frustrations with trying to find stable housing, his frustrations with trying to get work that would support him, his frustrations with trying to get his life turned around. The first step in, notice, in being ready for the bridegroom, being ready for Christ, is expecting that he's going to come, not just living life and letting it pass us by, but expect he's going to come. The second one is being prepared. At uh, many of the ceremonies that I get to officiate, uh, one of the steps in it, usually just before the ceremony of the rings, is I ask, do we have the rings? Now, the rehearsal happens before that, and uh, any pastors know that you always cue the best man and the maid of honor to say, yes, I do. And then we also check just before the ceremony begins. Right before we check the bride is ready, we make sure that the rings are in pocket. So that when I ask the question, they've got the rings. They are prepared for what's about to happen. That's the point of not having enough oil. Is half the bridal party wasn't prepared for the bridegroom to come. They needed to ensure that they had enough to go the distance. For bridesmaids, bridesmaids in the first century, that was oil. For us, what do we need to have enough of? to go the distance. The first thing the parable tells us is cued by the words, I don't know you. I don't know you. Perhaps one of the first things we need to have enough of to go the distance is a knowledge of God. We, of course, turn to the Scriptures. We, as Reformed and Presbyterian Christians, uphold the Scriptures as the way that we understand Jesus Christ, God revealed to us. Are we spending time in them? Are we learning what He sounds like as we read the Gospel narratives, or read the letters, or read the Old Testament passages, how they point to Him? Are we spending that time with God and are we spending time with him in prayer? Prayer kind of gets a bad rap for Presbyterians. We don't talk about it too much, but we need to talk about it more. Because quite frankly, prayer is the, the essence of what it means to be a Christian. 
Prayer is not kneeling by our bedside, though it can involve that. It isn't just kneeling by our bedside and sharing our litanies with God. It is a conversation. It is creating space in our lives to hear his voice and to sit in his presence so that we will have enough to go the distance. We will draw deeply from that well and be able to go out into the world and greet him. The other piece of having enough is cued by the parable that follows. Right after this parable and before the end of Matthew 25, we get the parable of the servants and the talents. Now, many of us who are old-timers and been around are familiar with this one, too. A man who is very rich, who's going off on a long trip, and he gives to his servants talents. This was a massive amount of wealth. Uh, And he gives to one five talents, one two, and one one. When he returns after a great deal of time, the one with five talents says, look, I've invested this, I've made it work for you, there are ten talents now. Well done. The second one with two says, look, I took two, and I made four out of that. Well done. And then the one with just one talent says, well, I I was scared of you because I know that you harvest where you haven't planted and and you reap where you haven't sowed and uh, and that you you can be cruel and I'm I'm scared of you and, and, and so I buried it. And now you have, wow, there's like dramatic emphasis there. And now you have one talent, safe and secure. And the master says to him, hold on. It would have been better for you to take that talent and invest it, because at least you would have made some money off of that. The whole thing in this context of Matthew 24 and 25 helps us to understand a little bit about what it means to be prepared. Are we prepared to take what God has given to us? It might be five talents, it might be two, it might be one, but are we prepared to take what God has given to us and make it work for his kingdom? Have we learned how to do that? Have we learned how to do that at different stages of life? Because let's face it, in my mid-40s, I don't have the energy I did in my mid-20s. So it's going to look different than it does when I was in my mid-20s. And so for each of us. Have we learned what our contribution is, what we need in order to make a contribution to the kingdom of Christ? Have we spent enough time with God's people so that we are not unduly swayed by other voices? We have a small group experience coming up uh, that explores the rhythms of Christian living. If you're looking to meet people or you're looking to go deeper in your faith or you're looking uh, to uh, join the church, this would be a great experience for you. I invite you to take part in it. Have we had enough experience with the vulnerable? Uh, David tells some great stories because he's doing some placement. I'm telling stories on you now. He tells some great stories of being down at Samaritan's House, which is uh, one of the shelters run by Island Crisis Care Society. And the stories that he hears from people, are we spending enough time with those who are not like us? Those who are encountering Christ in different ways. Those who are vulnerable and are in need of help. Are we spending, do we have enough knowledge to do what God has called us to do? I appreciate that uh, David, I'm not going to tell your age, David, but this is not his first career. Uh, David uh, is uh, not in his 20s. That doesn't make any value statement about him. Uh, However, he's not in his 20s. And, uh, And yet here he is getting the education that he needs to do what he believes God has called him to do. Have you learned what you need to learn? Do you have enough knowledge to be the kind of person that God has called you to be? Have you taken enough rest? Oh, we like to work, we Presbyterians, don't we? But we need to learn to rest well, too. I'm not just saying that because I'm about to take vacation, uh, though it is convenient. It's a challenge for me. Even this vacation, there are a number of things I know I'm going to need to deal with good things like our refugee family is arriving on Friday, coming. That's fantastic. I want to be part of that. So I need to learn the balance of work and rest, as we all do. Have we taken enough rest? When we have enough, when we are prepared, uh, then we'll no longer 
procrastinate or put off. We'll no longer let life just come to us and pass us by. But we will live expectantly. We will live prepared to greet Christ in the challenging and the comfortable, in the ugly and the beautiful. We will be prepared. We will be ready to greet him. Because Jesus has said, ready or not, here I come. Are we going to be able to find him? Let me say one last thing. When we find him, those moments become what Greek, in Greek is known as a kairos moment. Kronos is the passing of time that we measure. Kairos is the inbreaking of eternity. Can you imagine living a life where eternity breaks in moment by moment in the challenge, in the struggle, as well as in the beauty and the pleasure? When we live expectantly, when we live prepared, then we see that happen. We see the eternity break in. We greet Christ. And his kingdom grows in us like a bit of yeast in a lump, like a seed in the ground, slowly transforming us and transforming his world until the kingdom is known by all. Shall we do that? Amen. We've been using an affirmation uh, in order to uh, get this deep into our hearts, and this will be our last time uh, using the affirmation. David, would you lead us? All right, we'll read the affirmation responsively. If you could please read the text that is in yellow. We believe in the love kingdom of God through Christ upon us, within us, beyond us. We believe the love kingdom is like a mustard seed sown in apparent insignificance, growing into magnificence for the greening of the world. We believe the love kingdom is like yeast, inserted into humble insignificance into the dough of life, expanding into enough bread for the world. We believe the love kingdom of God is like a treasure, lost and rendered insignificant under the ground, now found with joy and thanksgiving. We believe the love kingdom of God is like pearls. All others become insignificant when the largest, most beautiful pearl of all is found. We believe the love kingdom of God is like a net of full fish, where even insignificant sardines are saved, but worm-ridden barracuda are thrown away. We believe in the love kingdom of God through Christ upon us, within us, beyond us where the meek and the poor, the merciful and the hungry rejoice with the angels of God. Loving God, we believe, scatter our unbelief. Amen. All right, one of the few things that did go right for me last week was that I did manage to turn in a final paper for one of the summer courses I did a few weeks ago. <laughs> yes, it was a very exciting moment to get rid of that. Um, but the paper was about the transformations of Christian worship in the 20th and the 21st centuries. And I argued that those transformations, in fact, began with the Psalms, specifically Psalm 100. So there is a very long and I thought quite straight line between us and all of those people that came before us that have put us where we are today. So with that in mind, when I wrote the prayers of the people, there is a short extract from three different psalms which connect to the petition that I wrote for us today. And like I said, it will, it will connect us with all those people that came before us. Now, the response to the petition is, your mercy is great. So could we please pray together? The first psalm is Psalm 119, verses 4 to 8. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Lord, we thank you for our community, our family, our friends, and our church. We pray that we may recognize God's presence in us and among us, and lead others to discover the spiritual realities of life. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, your mercy is great. All right, Psalm 145, 
verses 13 to 21. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The, Lord's uphold, the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. O Lord our God, you give light to those who sit in darkness. We lift up those who are without homes or jobs. We pray for people whose souls are mired in desperation. We pray for the sick and suffering among us. Hear us, O God. Lord, your mercy is great. And thirdly, Psalm 68, verses 7 to 10. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain at the presence of God, the God of Sinai at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you showered abroad. You restored your heritage when it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Make us free to be brothers and sisters, God of grace. Shatter the distinctions that create hatred and fear. Open our eyes to see one another as people who bear the image and likeness of Christ. We pray for all those who experience life's dark sides, those who struggle with sudden tragedy, hunger, life in a war-torn country. Help, us, uh, help those who face the darkness to find the light. Hear us, O God. Lord, your mercy is great. And now, as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, now the liturgical seasons of the church ebb and flow, just like the actual seasons. And with the rapid arrival, or seemingly rapid arrival of autumn, uh, people will return from holiday, kids will go back to school, older kids will go back to university, and the tempo of church life here will start to pick up. Now, if anybody is interested in participating in any of the missionary or, or, uh, missionary or ministries that St. Andrew's offers, then you can check those out on the church website, or you can speak to Jeremy or Emily, and Emily will be happy to point you in the right direction. Now, the work of the church is oops, made possible by the generous donation of its congregation. So thank you so much all for all of that. If you are in a position to give financially, you can do so online. You can do so by dropping checks off at the office, or there is a plate out in the narthex. Thank you all very much. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together. Be Thou My Vision.
Thank you, music team, for leading us. Thank you for being a part of worship. Now let's depart from this place, go back into our lives, and discover that Christ is hiding already there, that to those who are expectant and to those who are prepared, He is there to be discovered, and that He, in fact, He journeys with us, stretching out our hands and helping us to make the world into His image. When we go this way, we will discover Him there. And we will discover the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and empowerment of His Spirit in those moments throughout our lives and even forevermore. Amen. Go with God, friends. Even when